we are very happy. Uh, the whole uh, um, um, technology of society clusters, uh, and in particular, <laughs> <laughs> the three <laughs> coordinators of the cluster, that is Professor Calzolari, Professor Petit, and myself, uh, but also all of you, to have with us uh, um, Jonathan Ledgat. Um, uh, Jonathan is uh, um, a person uh, who has uh, many talents, so he's been a journalist, uh, working also in a war context, he's been a novelist, um, um, he has in particular made two books, one about giraffes. I haven't read this, but it is about uh, a strange uh, killing of giraffes in the Eastern uh, uh, Bloc, in Czech, the Czech Republic, if I remember well, which is still an unexplained, um, unexplained event. And then um, he, he had um, another novel, Submergence, who has been um, into a, um, also made into a film, by um, uh, Wim Wenders, the, the German uh, um, director. And um, that is uh, with a topic, I think, which is connected to what we are going to discuss today, that is the connection between uh, environment and uh, uh, technology war, this kind of human and the human world. And, um, mm, but this is not what he's going to um, tell us today. Today, he's going to focus on a project that he has, uh, this idea of uh, Interspecies money, which uh, um, is, um, I know we're going to learn today, but basically, from what I understand, is a way to transfer resources into uh, non human uh, species that are now under threat. Uh, we are witnessing uh, in the last uh, decades uh, a great um, uh, diminution in the um, um, diversity of life on earth. I think it's not the first time that it happened also when the meteorite killed the dinosaurs, but this time apparently it's not the meteorite, but humans who are responsible for, for that. Um, I will not um, uh, say anything more, anything longer, and I will uh, be very happy now to give the floor to Jonathan. Uh, well, uh, Nicola, uh, Giovanni, thank you very, very much. And uh, thank you all for being here. And um, also, uh, although I can't see you, uh, thank you to those participating uh, online. Um, so I'm just going, as we spoke about, uh, Nicola, I'm, I'm going to uh, make a brief overview, which will probably create more questions than, <laughs> than answers. Uh, what we are discussing today is something very uh, new, uh, which I think will be very significant, um, but uh, none of it is proven, and uh, uh, and it's up to you uh, to think through the rationale. I I'm particularly excited um, to have scholars who are interested in economics and law, um, maybe even in computational law. Um, I think these are sectors which are which are really vital for this idea to um, to take hold. Uh, as you'll note, there there are two universities who helped uh, incubate uh, this uh, project. Um, the EPFL is in Switzerland, and uh, I was a director of a kind of futurist program at EPFL, um, which is mainly computer scientists, mathematicians. Um, some biologists, and I'm still uh, a visiting professor at the Czech Technical University in Artificial Intelligence. And I think one very basic point that we can be sure about now is that uh, technologically, what we are proposing is credible. Now, we whether it can work at massive scale, that's something we have to prove. But with the advances that we have in AI systems right now, and the price points on sensors, um, I just want to table that right at the beginning, that what we are talking about is technically absolutely uh, feasible. Um, um, obviously, uh, this uh, brief introduction and our discussion will focus on non-humans, um, but this is a human planet. Uh, and I think right at the beginning, we should not confuse equity across the species divide is damaging to humans uh, themselves. Um, this is a picture I took a few weeks ago in uh, South Sudan. Um, 
many of you will know that South Sudan is one of several failed states in, in, in the world right now. Um, there's one million people now in South Sudan who have no shelter, who the River Nile flooded um, an area uh, several times the size of Tuscany. And um, uh, all of those villages are underwater and these children are really just living on what they can get from their local uh, environment. And um, I think if we think at this Sesame Street level, what the very basic things to understand, I appreciate you are not zoologists. <laughs> and so we just make some very elementary points here at the beginning. If we talk about where diverse life forms are on the planet, most of them are centered towards the equatorial belts. And that, of course, is where uh, human population growth is most dynamic. And uh, we can be sure about the evolution of AI. We can also be sure that in the next decades, um, that Africa will be front and center of our politics, of our economics. And, and, and that is the zone where um, humans and non-humans are in great competition. Um, and motion for science is indicating that um, smallholder farms, so farms only a couple of si times the size of this room, which is supporting maybe six, eight, 10, 12 people, uh, they, they, the, the need for those is um, to double uh, in surface area in the next 15 years. And obviously Africa's population is going to double before 2040. Uh, so uh, we, we believe that without very significant amounts of money being injected as in incentive structures on the front line, that uh, competition between those smallholder farmers and anything which is not a human and not a livestock animal uh, will be problematic. Um, and and we, we should really unpack this uh, point a little bit more thoroughly in the conversation. Just to give you uh, an idea, this is just drill down on that point a little bit more. Um, just we can pick many countries at random. This is Ethiopia. Uh, which is, I wouldn't say it's a failed state now, but obviously we've had a war in Tigray in the northern part of Ethiopia now for three years, uh, which we don't know whether 200,000 people died or whether 600,000 people died. We have no foreign correspondence in there. We have very few spies. Uh, we simply do not know what's happening uh, in, in that region. Ethiopia now has 120 million people um, it has 1,000 lions, it has 1,000 giraffes, uh, it has destroyed uh, most of the megafauna, most of the fauna, uh, most of the trees, most of the insect species. So, but the way I look at it, I'm a natural optimist, that there, that is a, a ready for regeneration. So you can look at a landscape like this, and you can look at it as somewhat denuded and very anthropocentric, um, or, uh, or you can actually say, well, that's an opportunity to actually uh, start reintroducing species. And then the question is how to do that. Um, so here we've got some of the uh, goals. Um, I'm gonna dig into the, the first one in a minute that cognitively, I mean, you're all exceptionally bright. So I'm sure you will uh, land this point, but the, uh, the there is an existential risk uh, presented by the evolution of artificial intelligence, which is a further rationale for interspecies mining. And, and we'll get into that. Um, the sort of headline goal on the biological side, um, an umbrella species is, pretty much a species which exists in a given ecosystem, which is providing many services to that ecosystem. And again, we, we talk about a large animal, a small animal, uh, uh, a tree, uh, it can be like termites, um, 
uh, bats, for example. Um, but uh, umbrella species are very useful because if you can identify a rare umbrella species um, which is in trouble, uh, and, and you can give that an identity and and uh, allow it to hold some value, which we will discuss, um, then you're actually helping a larger uh, ecosystem as well. Uh, and broadly speaking, um, our goal is to double um, the uh, population density of a given umbrella species within a given ecosystem. And we can discuss in a conversation from a biological sciences side about how you would pick those species from a biological point of view. Uh, but I'm I'm really dwell more on the economics uh, and computing rationale. Um, you can see those uh, numbers uh, there: eight V, ten M. This is my shorthand. Some of you may have seen uh, we had the Montreal Convention on Biological Diversity um, in November, and this set uh, a goal for the planet, uh, which all governments, uh, including the European Union, uh, signed up for, which is to protect 30% of the planet for nature by 2030. But as we go back to that slide there, uh, there's no money put on the table for that goal. There isn't really significant amounts of money. Uh, I think I think we've got in the pot five or six billion. Um, whereas Bloomberg uh, last month issued a report where they are calling for one trillion dollars of uh, money to be pushed directly into nature before 2030. And Bloomberg is a fairly conservative organization. So there is an enormous disparity between this uh, 30 by 30 goal uh, and, and the reality. Um, but the 8 v, uh, 10M is 8 billion humans on the planet pushing towards 10 million life forms. So that's kind of um, the, the goal by 2030. And obviously you have to prove that. Where it gets really interesting is trying to think through financial mechanism which um, is able to be pushed across the species divide and then able to be pushed back to these uh, very poor communities uh, and and for a cycle to flow. Uh, and broadly, uh, most of that money, uh, which certainly by 2030 will be in the low billions, um, will uh, be uh, given by uh, institutional finance. Um, so it, essentially large companies, pension funds, um, insurance companies who uh, want to uh, divest money into nature uh, and presently can't do so because they don't have sufficient verification systems um, will push uh, this, this money in. Um, yeah, and I just put in this uh, pitch at the end that, um, and I, I think this will be the something I would love to get out today is uh, even if it's just one of you to think in a substantive way around the law, uh, economics in particular, uh, of, of this idea. We have a very large, diverse group. And um, Chris, yeah, very briefly, I mean, Giovanni, you did a very good, uh, very kind introduction. Um, I left the, I worked for the Economist newspaper um, as a foreign and war correspondent, and I was the Africa correspondent for almost a decade. And when I left the Economist, one of the projects I got going was um, drone delivery uh, for medicine and blood. Um, some of you might have seen that um, in Africa. Um, and I want to emphasize that. What we're talking about today seems futuristic, but it's possible in the African context to um, to, to lay down new systems um, because you don't always have vested interests the way that we do here in, in Europe. And in three or four African countries now, the majority of blood in national blood banks is flown around by drone, which is just crazy <laughs> when we think about it. Uh, those are my novels. You mentioned that. Okay. Um, 
the one uh, extra point I wanted to get across is what we were talking about, and I think you get this very much uh, um, just through the ether, um, is very urgent what we're talking about now. It's not something that we can sit on for five, six, eight years. It's too late. Uh, this is a picture which was sent to me by a Somali uh, colleague of mine. Um, it was taken last month on the beach in Somalia. And does anyone know what this animal is? You're all doctoral students. You're all very bright. Does no one in the room know what this animal is? There is something similar, but I don't know if that they call it mana too or something like that. You know, this kind of like, like okay, I'll give you half marks, Giovanni. Yeah. yeah. They're, 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 there is an evolutionary species uh, called uh, Cyrenia, mm -hmm. um, which has two parts. One is the manatee, as you say, which is in the Caribbean um and florida and so on but there's another group which is called the dugong or sea cow so it's closely related to the elephant it's been on the planet for 35 million years very intelligent animal very intelligent very beautiful animal this uh female here she's being caught by the fishermen and they're about to eat her she might be and likely is the very last dugong on that uh, African coast after 35 million years. Whereas even 20 years ago, there were herds of hundreds, maybe thousands of this animal. You know? And I really got into this interspecies money because uh, when I was studying this particular animal, I realized that the last piece of science that was done in it was 1976 um in in the african context so that is a charismatic mega fauna animal <laughs> you're all very bright and none of you know what it is so this is illustrating the point that we have eight million species on the planet most of them will not um uh, be recorded or even remembered by us you know uh, I, I'm uh, coming from a Protestant tradition, but I love in the Catholic tradition all of these uh, strange saints. And there, there is some saint, Saint Jude, I think, who's the saint of lost, forgotten, and never remembered causes. <laughs> so I think uh, when we think about species extinction, we have to understand the first thing is there's a lot of species which are going extinct without us even remembering or knowing that it existed in the first place. Okay, the um, first really basic, we're going to ask two basic questions today. Um, this is the harder one uh, to land. Um, many of you will have read uh, about the evolution of artificial intelligence. Um, we, we can dig into that in, in more detail, but broadly, uh, artificial intelligence um, is an uh, optimization system um, built by humans for the human economy. And it's very expensive, obviously, to build uh, AI models, expensive to hire programmers, it's expensive to, to, um, um, to, to acquire data. Um, so, uh, but but we will progressively optimize our systems. We start with medicine, and then we go through agriculture, and then we go through transport, security, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and the existential risk is something like this, that uh, circa 2040, when Africa has doubled its human population, we might uh, we might be in a situation where we've created very powerful AI systems, narrow AIs, uh, which have not been trained on the natural world at all. So the existential risk is um, how will another life form, can be animal, tree, another species, how do they represent themselves? to these new computational systems. And if they're not able to represent themselves, um, is this um, uh, uh, creating a situation where these collective AIs 
um, are not weighting their interests in any way whatsoever. Um, what is interesting about this question is um, we, we have very powerful technology companies who are involved in interspecies money, like Google. Uh, no one has actually tabled this question in a systematic, thorough way. Um, and, and that is a, a really profound question and, and one reason for developing interspecies money. Uh, then the second part of that question is, what does it actually mean to see another life form? How do we see them technically? Um, how, how would we understand a little bit more about them? So I just very briefly um, just skip through those. But before I do that, I just suggest that we're using this term interspecies. I did not coin this term. Um, it, it's a term which has been around for a while. But I, I do confess that because I work for The Economist and I still review books for The Economist, I very sneakily reviewed this book uh, last year in which I came up with a definition <laughs> for interspecies. It's the new connections between humans and non-humans uh, being made possible by technology. In other words, uh, we live on the planet with 8 million other species. Um, we will, and we have, and we are uh, learning to see and comprehend those species in entirely new ways beyond the existing science and beyond the existing ethics. Um, the first way, um, this is from a Chinese pig farm, and the really kind of dystopian starting point with AI and animals is by far the most advanced artificial intelligence which is uh, understanding other species is coming out of Chinese pig farms. Uh, there they are now optimizing pig farming into skyscrapers 20 stories high, which a piglet is born, um, uh, she exists, uh, she dies without seeing the light of day. Uh, and AI is there um, monitoring the animal. Uh, this one is actually, um, uh, able to detect before human farmers or when uh, a sow is uh, pregnant. Um, but the interesting thing about that work that the Chinese have done is that they, um, they have um, deeply advanced uh, the study of how to give uh, facial recognition, how to track animals over time, and how to listen to animals and, and watch over them. Um, this is from my uh, uh, one of my uh, partners in interspecies money is the German um, Natural History Museum, which, like the British Natural History Museum, and uh, I'm not sure what what is the Italian equivalent to a museum. Uh, we have natural history museums in various uh, yeah. parts of and, Italy. Yes. Yeah, but in, in, in yeah, but in the German context. This museum also has PhDs and uh, professors, and it functions as an academic institution. And it received a grant from the German federal government of 1 billion, 1 billion euros to digitize life on Earth. And this is a system that they've set up here, which uh, you can just see uh, on the tray going around the corner there. Um, it's a robotic system where the insect collection goes around and it's photographed. Um, so, so they actually have, um, uh, the, I think the second largest insect collection in the world after Paris, uh, but they didn't really know what was in their collection. Nothing had been digitized. And so they have to, the collection is so large that they have to robotically uh, you know, scan, uh, scan the insects. And what they've discovered is about 20 to 30% of the insects which they had gathered in the 19th century are now functionally extinct um, in, uh, already in the world. Uh, the point here is um, the first um, uh, purpose of interspecies money is simply to catalog existing life. This is simply for another species to say, hey, hey, I'm here, I exist, I'm alive. Uh, and, and that is the very, very primary 
upwards and, and to do that as a living uh, a living uh, species in, in in a living ecosystem and and there are all kinds of taxonomies um, which we if anyone's interested we can get into that second area of artificial intelligence which is profound so, so the first is like catalog life on earth and digitize it uh, and, and create um, connections that way uh, the second is um uh, and this is uh, another group who's uh, aligned with interspecies mining it is using ai to comprehend other species so uh, there are several groups including this project seti a very very bright groups out of mit and caltech and cambridge in the uk and 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 they are uh, recording um, let's say higher level species uh, can be primates, uh, can be in, uh, intelligent birds like crows, but particularly whales, uh, cetaceans, um, to crack animal language. Um, and when we think within five years, certainly within 10 years, we will actually know what other species are saying with, with a degree of certainty that we presently don't already have. And for the lawyers in the room, there you can automatically jump on that and you say well hold on <laughs> if a, another species is able to express some intentionality in a way that's incontrovertible uh, and that extends the field of animal ethics and animal rights into new directions that we presently uh, may not be able to substantiate uh, and I think that is a very interesting uh, process. Interestingly, th these groups are very well endowed, and they're very well endowed for the simple reason that uh, NASA and US intelligence, other intelligence agencies, are very worried about how they would possibly communicate with alien life forms. So they feel that if we can actually crack the ability of talking to aliens as it were on Earth, uh, that we might actually be more capable of talking to alien species. In space. Um, I mentioned uh, the question of uh, that, that this is viable. Uh, this is uh, a sensor by my uh, friend, uh, Professor Martin Vikelsky. Martin runs a Max Planck Institute for Animal Behaviorology in, in Bavaria, um, or Bad Wurttemberg. Uh, anyway, he, he they produce $8. That sensor he's got in his hand costs $8 now. And he has two space satellites, which can track species around the world down to 400 gram body weight. So uh, a lot of species, you're studying it in situ in an ecosystem, but sometimes you want to understand how large uh, migrations of species uh, are happening, you know, so geese, how do geese move to the uh, 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 Greenland and back? You know? And you can actually track these individuals. Uh, the point here is um, it's going to get exponentially more affordable. And this is true of all of the technology stack which would be required for interspecies funding. If you start with satellites, you get down to drones, then you have uh, communities with Android phones, um, uh, then you have uh, genetic technologies like environmental DNA, um, which is going to get very, very cheap. Um, and not all of that is feeding in. Oops. I don't know what happened with the slides here. Ah. Oh, yes. Three different species of orangutan. So, so we have taxonomy or cataloging. Um, then you have comprehension, um, what we just spoke about, and now we talk about identity. So if we're really serious about interspecies money, then individually um, or collectively, depending on the species, um, you really need to give a stable identity to another species. Um, and we have a lot of primatologists in our group, uh, uh, some of whom have been working in Malaysia and Indonesia with orangutans and for great apes, um, which uh, 
uh, are, are really under threat on the, on the planet uh, and obviously our closest living relative, um, it's possible um, to give them an identity based on face recognition. So you use artificial intelligence to, um, to, to spin up for every individual animal um, uh, an individual identity. And in, in this context, each of these animals uh, will have a, a, um, what we call a dynamic digital twin. So you'll have a, a digital account which represents the physical animal and that digital account will hold some financial value and, and will be able to distribute that value based on A, being observed and B, providing simple services. And we, we can dig into that a little bit more. Um, th this uh, is the second question. So if we say um, there is an existential risk to life on Earth by not weighting the interests of non-human life uh, significantly, uh, and then we know that there is a competition for resources in the tropical belt of the planet, then the question naturally becomes, and here I'm a little bit cynical, uh, um, how do you push money at significant scale in that direction? Uh, now, obviously, interspecies money is just one of many different uh, approaches. <clears throat> we have ecosystem service models, we have protected areas. Uh, this approach is particularly valuable uh, in areas which are not protected. So poorer communities, where, which are not in a national park, which are never going to see a tourist, um, where, where scientists are not particularly interested in engaging with that species. Um, so in the interest of time, because I really want to um, focus on uh, discussion, I, I think there are so many questions. That, it's easier to sort of approach the topic this way, but in in a in a as Giovanni said, uh, giraffes are very close to my heart because I, I wrote a whole novel about this particular animal. Um, but I just use it here in a representational sense that individual giraffe or a herd of giraffe um, gets given a stable digital identity. Um, uh, uh, a mother with with a, a cheap Android phone, the cheapest Android phone you can buy. Uh, she is recording images of, of the giraffe and feeding them up periodically. Um, she then gets rewarded for those images. So essentially what we're talking about here is very large pots of money atomically distributed according to uh, verified measurements. Does that make sense? So when you're in the when you're in the field, uh, the community or an agent in the community is providing a measurement, can be a, a measurement of animal, maybe it's animal droppings, uh, maybe it's um, some other uh, measurement which the scientists want to observe. And in return for that, we get a micropayment. Because I think everyone here understands that, um, where's my phone? Yeah, I've got, I've got here, because I live in Kenya, so all my banking, everything, is done on, on this, you know, with face recognition app. Yeah, so I just, just got an app here, and even if you're the poorest person in the country, even if you're a school kid, <laughs> you're, you're, you're paying for your lunch you pay for your school fees, you pay for your bus ticket, whatever you do, you do it on your phone. That, that is already a proven technology. So in terms of uh, getting a payment for a service, uh, that's already happening. You know? um, if we extend it out, so the first service that a giraffe would ask for is simply to be observed. Um, but going forward, it gets much more interesting. A giraffe might... Um, uh, ask for veterinary services, you might ask for some kind of life extension. It's quite hard living in the wild. Most, most species which are in the wild live only two thirds of the time of the species 
uh, which is held captive on the zoom. So you might find that there, there is some uh, intermediate um, stage for, for other species where they're receiving a little bit more care and they, they pay for that. Uh, they, they might pay for services which get them through um, drought, forest fires, uh, other situations. Don't forget, we're, the time we're talking about, we're talking about political risk, economic risk, but we're also talking about a period of um, climate change risk as well. Uh, so there's this extra layer of, of risk for other species as well as for humans. Um, <clears throat> just give you a, a case study which is in play at the moment. Uh, this is uh, Rwanda. And um, so uh, we, we've agreed uh, with the president and the government of Rwanda, all the various ministers, that they want to trial uh, interspecies, interspecies money uh, at a national level uh, in their unprotected areas, that's to say 90% of their country. Uh, and they want to do this on a 70 million to 100 billion dollar scale um, to see if they, if they, if the idea works. Um, and in, in, in Rwanda, uh, in the north, uh, we see, oh, do we have a pointer here? Where's the, uh, oh yeah. yeah. So up here is uh, the Volcanoes National Park. And that's where the mountain gorillas uh, live. And they've doubled their population in the last 20 years if you're looking for some good news story. What is it, what is really weird, uh, I was telling Marco this at lunch, was I was with the central bank governor in Rwanda last week, and he gave me the figures uh, for last year um, for Rwanda. If you want to go and see a gorilla, and unless you guys are from a very wealthy family, it's going to be really expensive, because it costs you $1,500 to, to climb up the mountain and have a look at the gorillas. You have to pay a license fee to go and see the gorillas. There's a lot of rich people in the world who quite happy to do that. And last year, the, those gorillas, they brought in $162 million, which is an equivalent of 1.5% of Rwanda's GDP. And down here, where I was last week, is where the chimpanzees are. And chimps are not, alas, as popular as gorillas, uh, and you only have to pay several hundred dollars. But the point is that these species are already contributing significantly to uh, uh, the government. And if we look at um, a country like India, for example, uh, where we're talking to the Reserve Bank of India, uh, you know, there's 20 or 30 species there, which even without getting into uh, the smaller and rarer species, um, you know, are already charismatic and already able to uh, receive an identity or hold some value. So with Rwanda, we're talking about giving a secure digital identity to all of their great apes. And then um, uh, to, to bring it um, to uh, a, a, a more profound scientific level, um, this is a straw-colored fruit bat. Um, they're slightly creepy <laughs> species. They're about so big, and and they they live in a group of trees. Um, uh, but they are the most extraordinary animal. Uh, they're individually not that intelligent, but their collective intelligence of of ten thousand fruit bats is very very high, and they fly 50, 80, 100 kilometers uh, to, to feed. And as they fly, they drop their seed in their, their droppings of the fruits they've already eaten. And we can say that the whole Congolese rainforest from Kenya all the way across to Cote d'Ivoire is seeded by these animals. I mean, the elephants play some part, but the bats do everything. And the bats uh, population has collapsed by half in the last 10 years. So under an uh, interspecies money, and I just cite this as a, as a clear example, just to get your minds uh, working. Under this example, 
uh, a bat colony, we receive a collective identity. So if it's a great ape, it's an individual through their life. If it's, if it's uh, uh, something like a bat colony, then you're actually taking a, a digital identity for the whole colony, uh, and, the, and the colony holds that value. Um, and, and then is able to pay the community for this cohabitation, you know, because it's hard for a community, right? Bats are loud, they're smelly, they take up trees, children, goats, animals, uh, they want to go under the trees and the bats get stressed out and that's why their population fails. So if a bats can actually pay the community and say, hey, this area here, Please leave it alone and please observe us in the morning and the evening as we go up to feed. Um, and, and by the way, with this, this is a really good example of how AI gets us to a different level uh, because both with vision and with sound, so we can count the number of bats in the colony. You, know, you, can, you can machine learn the visuals. I, I shoot a video on an on a, on a, on a Android phone, and then you can mathematically pull out the, the population density. But even better, you take the sound sample, and you can pull out individual voices. You would even be able to tell how stressed that colony is. You know, what what are they uh, talking about? They're very vocal animals. Um, so just to round up. Um, I think one thing, uh, and that would be very uh, grateful if anyone has any ideas about this. Uh, we, we're, we're right at the stage now where we're structuring this interspecies money group. And obviously we have a lot of VCs who are very interested in this work. Um, but it's, it, we are meant to be representative of other species. So maybe a VC player is not the right play, um, uh, but maybe a not-for-profit is too slow. So we, we have to legally think about the structure of uh, the, the, this organization. Um, uh, then uh, we, we've, we've got different working groups, uh, obviously on the computing side and conservation science side. I, I would very much like to have um, a working group, even if it's periodic, which involves law. Uh, economics obviously cuts across to our finance working group. Um, but I'm sure some of you, if you are interested, would, would be very welcome to participate. Um, <clears throat> we, we working with uh, Google. Uh, we'd like to work with uh, OpenAI and, and, and we're exploring the possibility of uh, working with some of the Chinese um, AI companies as well, um, if that is possible in the sanctions environment. Um, Obviously, what we want to prove in the next few years is that, that this is a it is possible to push identity and value across the species divide. We're really talking about financial inclusion, not just the poorer communities, but um, beyond. Um, and then we talk about money, the umbrella species. Um, yeah, again, um, most of the money is not obviously held permanently by other species, it's farmed on. Um, so it's probably a better way of thinking about this to think that money is rooted through diverse life and out of diverse life into human life and then rooted again, you know. Um, there may be an innovative financial mechanisms there. I have some people in my group who feel that it would be more um, Cost effective if a uh, species was lending money uh, 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 or providing insurance services or some other product to the community than just giving money. Uh, we, we, we'll have to prove that. Um, uh, Giovanni was asking me, I don't know, did any of you have a chance to read uh, the Brookings paper, uh, which was sent out? Uh, so maybe. Maybe uh, Giovanni can make sure that everyone has that. Yeah. yeah. Um, there, we, we talked through um, the sort of end game uh, for this is, um, is it possible to create a new central bank for other species? You know, um, uh, and if you created a, a bank for other species, would, would that bank hold its own digital currency? 
in, in other in other words, uh, which is one of the important topics for discussion. Um, it, it, the uh, it, it, when we say what way can a species hold value, perhaps um, they have their own distinct uh, digital currency. Everyone's familiar with central bank digital currencies. To say one CBDC would be uh, held by non-human life on Earth, and, and and the mega goal, my final point, um, is obviously to get to uh, you know 2050 uh, with uh, not just uh, biodiversity intact, but actually seeing a regeneration of uh, of life. Um, so if we look at Ethiopia or wherever that they've actually increased uh, quite considerably uh, numbers of species. So th those are just some basic uh, overview points. And uh, maybe I'll just leave the map up there just to concentrate our minds on where, yeah, I don't rule out that this could be applied in Italy or in France. It's possible, but in countries with functional governments and fairly functional protected areas, it, it may not be necessary. Um, um, and that's just an open question. Uh, most of our thinking is obviously focused on poorer communities, uh, which are more dynamic. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks a lot for this great uh, presentation. And uh, I should have said it before, but this initiative is just a continuation of the previous uh, human important humanitarian activities by Jonathan, such as uh, the no, merging technology and a humanitarian, now also a tran transhuman perspective. That is uh, um, his work on, um, uh, which he mentioned uh, on uh, uh, blood delivery by drones, which has really had an important impact, uh, especially, especially in Africa. Uh, but let us um, now move into the discussion on, uh, on the issue of uh, um, interspeeches and money. So if there is any, um, I'm sure there's going to be questions or curiosities. And so uh, I see already one and two hands and then the, so please give the one to the floor. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the presentation, really interesting. I had two questions, one small one. Yes. Uh, one question was about DNA. So is that part of the cataloging and have you thought of yeah. DNA and cloning yeah. and among that? In cloning, would that be? Oh, oh yes. Sorry. Um, well, DNA, uh, absolutely. Um, we, we have. Um, uh, you're familiar with environmental DNA, yeah. So, environmental DNA, for those who don't know, is where you take a water sample, soil sample. Uh, and uh, very soon an air sample, and it will, you know, every life form um, sheds a little bit of its DNA as it goes around. Sometimes it's a snake, a mouse, human, um, and we know obviously this from uh, crime scenes. <laughs> it's really, really hard uh, for a, a, a criminal to uh, not leave a trace of himself and similarly for other species. Uh, what is really interesting about eDNA is um, uh, the, the COVID. Uh, so the same sequencing machines you use for for COVID um, uh, testing um, uh, can be transpurpose for eDNA, and and the, and the, and the exponential drop in price of eDNA samples. So in Rwanda, as one element of what we're talking about will be to take water samples along the rivers. Um, and it, especially in the rainy seasons, when all the DNA is like washed into the river, uh, you actually can have an enormous uh, catalog of all the species, birds, insects, trees, plants, animals, which live in that surrounding area. What is really wacky, and referencing that point I was making about un the unknown, and never remembers is like 90% of DNA material 
is a species unrecorded by science. So uh, we really don't know a lot of uh, species which exist on Earth. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and so there is an element of species discovery. Uh, cloning, there are groups in the States who are looking at uh, bringing back extinct species. Um, and I would say really, uh, George Church at Harvard, uh, who's a brilliant, uh, truly brilliant mind, is leading a que uh, quest to bring back the Tasmanian tiger and the, uh, the mammoth. Uh, and, and those are really super sexy, but I would prefer the dugongs and other animals that are actually still around. <laughs> you know, because essentially, economically, we've got an economist. How many economists are in the room? Are you all lawyers? You're an economist. Yeah. So this is the ultimate economic question, which is like another life form, very rarely can another life form, unless you're a racehorse or something, or mountain gorilla, it's really rare for another life form to hold value in the human economy beyond its uh, processed body parts. You know, so it's always got more economic value dead than alive. So, so the profound question that you're trying to solve here is like, how can you be represented economically, have value when you're alive and not just dead? You know. Uh, and the DNA and well, there was so that was a very small question, but yeah, oh, yeah. apparently that was yeah. small. So the second question is, is more political, I guess. I think a lot of the discussion remind me question of gender equality, um, especially when you, I think it was the second aim of trying to give a voice to the animals. Um, so a lot, but not all, would argue that female humans, we can understand them, they even have financial sources, but they're still very underrepresented. Um, and maybe the main way to go about it is to give in voting rights, right? Um, so in a way that they have power over the other species. Um, so how would that go about? Because I mean, uh, money, of course, is a strong power, but I think it will only go so much. So if it would be too harmful for people, so, so no, how no, would, uh, great... would AI solve those kind of conflicts? And if so, based on which benchmark? Yeah, it's a great. Uh, am I supposed to press it again or? Okay, it's okay. Uh, it's, it's a little bit starsy like this. this. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's a wonderful question. Uh, and uh, even though what I work on and what I think about is very futuristic, there's no question in my mind that someone has worked in Africa for a long time now, um, that the number one issue is rights for young women and, and women in general, you know, unless in, the, in these rural communities, girls, uh, and young women and, uh, and and women's cooperatives are empowered. You're really not going to see uh, much uptick in equity or in governance and so on. So it's very likely that uh, on the ground it will be women's groups um, and girls who who are going out and those uh, women and girls are the ones who are going out into the forest now to gather uh, firewood and other uh, forage, other resources, you know. So it makes perfect sense that they um, can then earn a quite significant income uh, by providing simple observations or simple services. Um, and I think obviously uh, even the same species in it will vary in in the in the in the game theory and in, in the in the in the way that a project is undertaken from one ecosystem to another according to the local uh, economy and according to the local customs but we, we obviously have a long period of uh excellence in community conservation um people have really thought very, very hard, like Ellen Ostrom and other people have thought very, very hard and very excellently about how communities can participate and how they can work for their local ecosystem. But the problem has always been there's no money. And if we want to get from, I'm guessing about one and a half to $2 billion on the front line now to $1 trillion 
dollars on the front line by 2030, then clearly we have to have multiple approaches at massive scale, things which are unprecedented in human history. You know, but women and girls have to be right at the front of that. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, it's really, really interesting. And I have two questions, both of them not fully formed yet. So it's more in input and, and I'm curious to know what you what you think about it. Um, but while you were explaining the, the example of the app um, down, downloadable on every Android phone, which I think it's like a very nice practical way to describe the idea. Um, I was thinking about something that I was reading recently, like about what are the motivations that drive uh, individual actions for a common goal. Uh, and uh, I mean, the, the four motivations recognized by the literature are mainly uh, egoism, altruism, uh, collectivism, and principalism. And basically, when you design an app and principalism, so it's very like hierarchical, you do that because yeah. I recognize, you know, yeah, the, yeah. The, the leader or the power. Um, and when you when you ask people to download an app and perform a small act in, in exchange for money for a small transac transactional value that, that is money, basically, my question is, do you recognize that egoism is more effective in solving collecting actions when there are failed states or there is no, not a very good central coordination? Um, and the, the following question is related. Um, so I don't know, um, I'm uh, studying competition law, European law, so this is not my field, uh, but I happened to, to hear a presentation recently about uh, South Sudan. So I think it might be a context where you where your approach could could be um, adopted, um, and in this presentation, uh, the lecturer was uh, was explaining quite um, a, a detail with with a high level of detail the economy of uh, um, tribal cattle, cattle riding, and it, I mean it it sounded to me that the economy of those tribes are really different from our economy, you know, like and uh, and I wonder whether uh, I mean. This specific, so it's it's a specific example, but uh, uh, basically tribe uh, rely a lot on cattle riding from one tribe to another, um, and when riding cattle, there are very complex dynamics, uh, uh, like social dynamics, uh, for which you have to rely a lot on other warriors uh, or other riders, uh, and egoism. Uh, there are like social mechanisms at play to punish uh, uh, hi hyper egoist behaviors, and so when you try to, uh, so I'm not even sure that people living like in these tribes have a phone, like might be uh, like the specific cases where even phones are not available. But if you have to, to operate in this dimension, would operating like with a monetary transaction work or might maybe other like approaches might not egoistically based, but based on values might be more successful. And at the same time, isn't there a bit like, imposing our view on a specific, like having a, and this is more a methodological question. So you're trying to solve a problem basically in, on a very, very wide area of the map uh, and having an approach that, that starts from the general and then you decline it into the particular, what, what are the limits of that and how, how do you go about that? No, it's a brilliant question. Um, uh, I think, you know, South Sudan, you kind of hit the nail. I mean, that's a country I know well, and uh, it, 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 you know, uh, there we talk about cow, not economics, but cowonomics. Um, uh, 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 do we have, mu how much time do we have? Can I, do I have enough time for an anecdote? No. Uh, uh, just, just, just an anecdote to tell you um, how it is in South Sudan. A, a few years ago, uh, during one of the wars, I was on the front line and went to the field hospital and there was a young warrior. So basically these tribes, as you, say uh, are are attacking each other to steal their cows um partly because of climate change uh, you know that a lot of cows die in, in, in floods and dry in droughts and then the warrior class they want to assert themselves and uh, if you steal enough cows you're kind of sexier to your future spouse and, and so on um Anyway, there was this young warrior who uh, had been shot up in his legs and um, and the uh, Médecins Sans Frontières um, surgeons were operating on him. And uh, the surgeon called me into the operating theater 
and they had that kind of anesthetic, which was the uh, kind of liquid anesthetic, which keeps people kind of half under, not completely under. Um, so he was kind of dreaming as he was being operated on. And, and he was seeing a song and very kind of plaintively singing the song while he was on the operation table, which was uh, the words of which were something like, my brown and white cow is the most beautiful cow in the world. <laughs> so even when the guy is being operated on, he's thinking about his cow, you know? <laughs> And uh, I think your point is more uh, larger and more profound, which is like, uh, you have this planetary mechanism, this digital layer that you want to lay down, you know, it can only work locally where it makes sense biologically and culturally. And it may be, as you say, that in some situations, you, that the payout is of, of the animal or the other species can be trees. Um, uh, the payout is not necessarily cash. Could be like solar lighting. Could be security. Could, could be some uh, some services to the community. I, I, I don't think we can speculate at this stage. Uh, we, we can suggest, you know, this kind of plural approach, but but but. But I think that's going to be something that's going to be a discipline in and of itself, you know. Uh, but what will not change is uh, that it will be the other species which in some way is representing their interests, you know, and, and that they are and they are dispersing something of value uh, in return for the representation of their interests. And that that is something which is, um, I think, novel. I I, th I think in in very insecure areas where you have bad actors, where the community are not in control of those actors, this may not work, you know. But in my experience, um, in emerging economies, most communities most of the time just want to get by. Uh, they want to get their harvest in. They, 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 they want to survive and they have very little cash and they'll be very grateful for a little bit more. Okay, thanks a lot. And Nicola? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, but um, for for the uh, for most species, it will be a kind of proxy of the species, right? Uh, Thank you. Um, it, it's a very interesting question uh, whether this is capitalist, post-capitalist. I mean, obviously, uh, neo-Marxists ha have railed at me predictably uh, that you're sort of financializing nature. But I actually think it's the opposite. Uh, I would say I would say that by uh, by including non-humans in uh, the human economy. Uh, that actually you're corrupting extreme capitalism, right? Because you're introducing 
uh, other forms of agency, right? Because they don't want to buy houses. They don't want to buy Lamborghinis or Rolexes. <laughs> they, they, they just hold money and then spend it on very basic, they, they, on, on existence values. Right. Yeah. So if that's the case, then... <laughs> because I think I think that uh, those questions are very complex, right? Um, and and they will, but but they're also organic questions, right? They're all they they are. Uh, if a general principle is understood, that uh, that the planet Earth needs a diversity of intelligences in order to survive, you know. We, 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 it cannot just be the case that the human intelligence, uh, you know, and, and our AI is a very weak AI because it's just purely uh, rooted through human intelligence. You know? So if, if we want to keep those diverse intelligences alive, uh, we have to keep them in existence. Right? And uh, so, okay, so what happens in... You know, I think that's it's a little bit like the, um, the question of thinking about extreme human poverty, like the, the needs are so great. So the, the gorillas, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, get all the money because everyone wants to see the gorillas, but the termites do not get any money because... Ah, yes, no, that's a great question, Nikola. That, that, that is the presupposition of what we believe is that we start with uh, mountain gorillas which gets on the front page of the New York Times. But over, over a period of time, and probably quicker than we imagine, uh, that financial flow is actually moving to the termites, right? Because termites are, uh, not just termites, but it's moving to the base of the ecosystem, which is actually providing the most services. And why is it going to do that? It's because most of the money uh, the vast majority of the money is coming from institutional finance. Institutional finance, which is holding like brown portfolios, and they're looking at that, and and then they 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 want to become more regenerative. Um, and they you're going to get a lot more bang for your buck um, by pushing money into uh, smaller uh, species, which are which are providing a heavier lift within the ecosystem. And just on that institutional finance question, the weirdest thing that has happened to me in the last couple of years, pushing this idea, is it is the most conservative institutions which are the most open to the idea, right? So I was talking to the Bank de France the other week, and they, because they are, anyone who's in the stewardship business who is thinking in a multi-decade approach, they see... Uh, collapse of biodiversity, uh, you know, as a significant risk factor for them. So uh, pushing one, two percent of value in, into nature is actually uh, a no brainer for them. Right? They, they're quite happy to do that. OK, and so why?
um, super interesting. Um, on the AI agents, um, I've I'm, I'm sorry, on the carbon first, let's get the carbon out of the way. Uh, it, it's, I'm not a big believer in the carbon market. Um, and a lot of people uh, would come to our group um, and, and say, well, you know, this is brilliant. It can add 5% of value to a, a carbon offset project. Let's say you're, you're in Congo, Brazzaville, and you've got 50,000 hectares of rainforest. If you can show you've got these species in the rainforest, then you can maybe get an extra premium on your carbon offset. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm happy that carbon offsets are around. I think they will get disrupted very quickly for two reasons. One, because they are not observed data, they're model data. So when you actually get into carbon projects, there's a lot of junk data a lot of junk. Um, so you have projects where they're selling carbon 20 years into the future in politically unstable countries. I mean, it's just kind of madness, right? Um, there's no way that those countries are able to assure those carbon projects over that period of time when they've already spent the cash <laughs> in their hands, you know? Uh, that's one reason. Um, and the second reason is obviously um, you have to bet on human engineering um, to uh, pull down carbon in, in engineered ways, you know, wh whether it's uh, natural systems in the ocean um, or, or, or uh, machine-led um, extraction on geothermal power plants or, or, or um, you know, Bill Gates' big bets on, on next-gen nuclear. All, all of that is going to collapse the price of uh, carbon uh, offsets. And that doesn't address the main question, which we want to address, which is if we took a time machine to, to 2180, what are we actually looking at on planet Earth? And, and well, with that, whatever that future uh, generation of human AI species looks like, would they forgive us um, for uh, having overseen uh, through sheer laziness i would say uh the you know the extinction or the great diminishment of many many species so we're, we're trying to solve for a different problem we're solving for the problem of embodied life forms to do home problem <laughs> you just say like i evolved now no one's saying that like, should you exist forever as a species Maybe not, you know, maybe uh, nature gives us a certain amount of time and a certain structure and then, then you then you dissolve. Um, but clearly that's not what we're talking about here. I mean, we're, 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 we're talking about uh, processes, the speed of which uh, we are destroying other life forms is so profound that um, it, it needs to be slowed down. I mean, even, even just legally or ethically, you, you would say, you know, you can park the long term question of whether money always has to flow. Maybe it's only a question of four decades or five decades. And maybe, but money itself, as we all know, is, 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 um, is changing in and of itself, right? Money is becoming more like intention and attention, right? The money on the internet is a bit dopamine led. And, and so, the nature of money is is profoundly, yeah. Anyway, thanks a lot. May I? Is that a question? Otherwise, I, I can please go. Hey, Jonathan, thanks a lot for for the talk. So, even though I'm the economist uh, in the room, I'm gonna ask a couple of what I think are more political science questions. Um, because for me, the politics of what you're proposing are very hard to obviate, right? You're suggesting that basically, if I understand properly, there's a pool of money that comes from these agreements and then it's somewhat distributed, no? But have you have you thought a little bit about how that would come along? Because towards the end of the talk, you mentioned the creation of a bank. And I know in your work, you compare it to the Bank for International Settlements. 
But when I think about the Bank for International Settlements, it was created during a period of uh, post-war and basically to settle a war. So it's very easy to, you know, for the winner to, to force the loser to, to agree on their terms. And also related to what you were saying before, no, of the, the farmer that then is going to be the one that's going to, for example, take the pictures. So how, how do you decide which, which uh, species fall into, into the program, how much money each species is? I, I mean, at the end, that, that's why you're giving it a monetary value, right? So that you can compare them. Uh, all, all of these things, which for me are more of a political nature, I, I struggle to rasp them a little bit. So if you could talk about the fight more, thanks. Can I follow up with the related question? So maybe you can address them together. Uh, while you were talking, I was thinking that basically there, like in this structure, there is a unilateral flow of information, basically like the, um, who develops the app or the bank or the institution distributing the money designs the information that has been asked uh, and there is no way for feedback coming from uh, you know the farmer or the person taking the picture or using the, the, the app um, no way to communicate knowledge that might be already there like people living in the environment that might know way more than what they're asking we are we are asking them and have also different uh, you know uh, different information about uh, about the nature and the species that they interact with almost daily you know this is the, the premises um, I'll just start with that point, and then we'll get to your, uh, because uh, um, I would say, it, I would spin it on its head. I would, I would uh, say exactly the opposite. I would say that this is a major disruption in the way that we think about communities. So we say that in the moment, most communities receive no value or no agency. Like when I was last week with the chimps in uh, on the Congolese Rwandan border, you know? It's a very poor village. The chimps are running through the village every now and again, stealing fruits. Um, tourists come through um, and, and observing the chimps. The community doesn't have any input in that process whatsoever. No one is asking them uh, to record anything about the chimps. No one's uh, educating them about the animals. Um, uh, uh, who is in charge of that is a Western uh, NGO um, w with a with a Land Rover, um, and, and and you know they're getting their money on a project based approach. You know, four or five year grant funding. Uh, so this disrupts that model completely, and then you end up with. I mean, in, on the AI side, a lot of our AI scientists are game theory people, you know. So obviously we're talking about open systems. It's not a closed system. And it, and it remains to be proven to what extent you can lay down uh, a digital layer on an open system. But the, the intention is exactly what you're saying to bring the community and the other species closer together so the community is observing it's getting rewarded for being observed the the other species has a little bit more space and 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 uh, better life outcomes all around us you know? um uh, yeah who gets to decide which species i mean i'm a little bit cheap on this point because you know it's going to get icky and messy. Uh, 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 what you were saying also, Nicola, at, at some point, like, you know, how much money is enough <laughs> for a species, which species? You know? But right now, the, 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 uh, the needs are so extreme and so great that we have uh, the IUCN red list, you know, which has like 2,700 species on the edge of extinction. Uh, we can pick 700 species without any dispute, uh, most of whom are getting no science, no observation, nothing is happening for them, nothing at all, you know, even as we saw with the dugong, major intelligent animal, you know. So obviously you want the scientists in the loop, uh, you want the local conservation organization, and you want the community. Uh, and probably going to have to have some interface with the government as well, you know. But I also think that there are, and this is where it gets very interspecies. Um, I think that we are, 
and maybe I'll distribute another paper I wrote on this point, which is is, is getting a bit more Italo Calvino and a little bit more. Uh, it, it's it's channeling my novelistic side a little bit more, but but I do think um, for uh, you know ordinary people like someone is walking to work in, in Padua uh, in the morning, and maybe they can interact with another species. In, in, a, in a different way, right? Maybe they have a totem species that they are participating in. And then there is an exchange of information, culture, uh, knowledge, which which doesn't exist um, at this point. But in terms of the governance mechanism, when you talk about economics and law, then really you you are building, it doesn't have to be on a, on a blockchain. Um, and I'm a little bit skeptical on the crypto side. Um, uh, but I don't say no, 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 but maybe not. Uh, but nevertheless, there are some decentralized governance structures which are very interesting uh, and where you're going to have stakeholders, you know, so communities and stakeholder. I mean, what what is the other species? How does it represent itself? It's it's a collection of uh well I don't know what you have in Italy when you go for uh, for a, I can't remember when you're walking in the forest, the countryside here. Do you have like countryside rules, Giovanni? Like yeah. when you open a gate and there's a sign and it says, here are some simple things to do. Um like like in England or in Scotland, um actually Scotland, I'm Scottish, so Scotland's a bit more free, but but generally, you, you go into a farmer's field and, and there's a sign and it says, oh, please close the gate. If you have a dog, don't let your dog off the knees. Maybe don't light a fire. Maybe don't pick up your rubbish. You know, Reese. You should you know, just decide, try not to rub it, not enter, and that's it. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, <laughs> gosh. Uh, we're a little bit more general. No, no, but in the, in the public, in the public spaces, you get in private spaces usually. <laughs> But the point is you have just like four or five simple rules, right? Yeah, yes, yes. So that's really at the early stage. It doesn't solve any of your longer term questions where the academic mind wants to navigate yeah, <laughs> <laughs> too. But 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 the up curve is so big before you get to that problem. Um that the, yeah, there are messy problems, but they're here. And yeah. So Well, I mean, that's exactly what our economic finance working committee would actually have to be thinking about really seriously, robustly, you know, um, right, right, right from now, right? It's very, very critical. I mean, my goal in the next year or so is to get 100, $150 million of testing, um, which is sufficient, I think, to persuade scientists, economists, lawyers, um, if I was successful, right? Because it may not be successful. It may be that you trip over your shoelaces right at the beginning, you know? But then you would still learn something even so, right? You know, may maybe the lesson you would learn is, no, you can't push identity and money across the species divide after all. Uh, it's too complicated. Uh, humans are too mendacious. Um, but but I suspect that we would have a positive outcome. And, and then at that point, you know, a large piece of that work is building that financial market. But my experience, you know, I can't remember how you say this in French, but in, in, in English, you say proof is in the pudding. <laughs> Do you have that expression in French? It's very British. Yeah. <laughs> But the bankers, they tell me, and we would push money, we we're desperate to push money into nature, you know, but we just need it to be verified. You know? I'm like, okay, we're going to verify it. Now, will you push money into nature? Can I, uh, can I put a question to you? 
So it seems to me that there is a kind of, um, I don't know if you are adopting a kind of meritocratic approach in sharing money between the species. So depending on their contribution they do to the human welfare, then you give money to them. In the case of the, the, the points, it's a kind of a counter -tactory on how worse would it be if we didn't have the bats? Then we would be much worse because we wouldn't have the seeds. And, uh, okay, let us quantify and then give the bats the money. Other species may give a little of non contribution to human welfare. Um, some insects, if they weren't there, probably wouldn't care. I don't know. There are other, other animals, which are even rats. So if they weren't rats around, maybe some kind of rats they would be even better. So um, I'm wondering, um, um, usually there is the distinction whether everyone should be should receive in proportion to their contribution to society or according to their needs. It's a kind of basic political divide. So I was wondering, in distributing the money to the species, uh, uh, would you be for the meritocracy or uh, according to equality or to me or, or even to, um, to needs uh, or to, uh, yeah. Uh, or to basic needs, I don't know what the uh, speech is. How would you? Sorry, please. Yeah, can I add? Oh, wow. It's ah, yeah. uh, sorry. To this, I, I, I have a similar feeling that when I hear you, I feel the narrative kind of leans between either a meritocratic approach or maybe um, instills this, rightly so, this fear of extinction of endangered species. And so I want to add on to this question. Um, is it then the, the, the project that you're working on, is it interspecies money or more? When, when I hear it, it, it comes to my mind, okay, maybe it can be justified if we call it endangered species money, or if in, in the other case, maybe meritocratic species money, but not necessarily interspecies money. And to add on to it, I've, I'm an anthropologist by background, so very little knowledge of law or economics. So I'm very familiar with multi-species ethnography literature. Um, and one thing that stands out for me on top of this way of valuation is, have you maybe considered, and I think this should be considered at the prototyping designing phase, the pitfalls of identity-based valuation? And um, to give you one or two very short examples, maybe one thing to consider would be how would your narrative on protecting the vulnerable and the endangered or the brilliant shift if you were to include um, the idea of other species that we co-inhabit the planet with, for instance, the microbial life. And if we look at a hundred years ago, penicillin or antibiotics were considered the magic bullet. We found it, it's the human, genius breakthrough and we are now at a stage where um we are really scared of the superbugs that it might not be the virus or the other it, we might the, yeah the human life might end because of superbugs it's just you know it kind of destabilizes a little bit um this idea of protecting the vulnerable and creating this whole apparatus whereas it also understanding that there are other species that might make themselves heard by showing uh, or threatening our very existence. Uh, so it isn't about protecting them, but maybe being scared of them or just learning from them that we overused antibiotics. And the other example, again, which kind of interferes with this very uh, individual identity-based empowerment, maybe taking back more uh, these concerns about feminism and how so in the seven, this is coming, this is not my project, it's coming from a fellow anthropologist who was working on how in the 70s, when the hormonal contraception pill was uh, invented, it was supposed to be a breakthrough empowerment for women. Whereas now there are a lot of women that are choosing to leave these hormonal contraceptions uh, because they also realize it's pretty bad for the environment and it's destroying the oceanic life. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a lot of uh, negative impact of uh, hormonal contraception pills in the in water with the metabolites. So it's just, and what I am interested in is how te technological advancements take into account our symbiosis with other species. And I'm just, yeah, how would you, maybe in short, just share, yeah. I think I've re-emphasized the, 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 the whole point of interspecies is exactly what you're saying, which is that there are um, 
found new relationships which are developed uh, as a result of our layers of discovery. And if we think we've discovered a lot in the last two decades, which we have, I can guarantee you in the next decades, we, we, we will discover a lot, a lot more. Um, uh, on this question of merit, meritocracy, um, which you uh, raised, uh, I, I think there, there is a very, um, uh, I mean, uh, our starting point is uh, uh, there is a concept in zoology called edge species. Mm. Um, so an edge species is a species which is rare and has evolutionary distinction. In other words, it, 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 it occupies a piece of the evolutionary ladder distinct from other species. It doesn't have many cousins, uh, uh, aunts and uncles. Uh, and, and if that species was to disappear, and then a whole way of being on the planet uh, will uh, disappear. It's about 2,700 of those species which have been uh, observed. Uh, and, and obviously a lot more when we include insects and microbial life, as, as I personally believe that most of that interspecies money would, would flow towards these smaller life forms. But I do think um, it slightly solves your uh, meritocracy question because utility function is only one piece of it. You know, it, the it existence function, I, I think for our generation, for your lifetimes, for the lifetime of your children, uh, if you have children, uh, really what we're talking about is just the existence. Just, 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 just hang around the planet uh, for long enough. Um, but do bear in mind that we have non-human intelligence. We have human intelligence, but now it's three-dimensional chess that we are created uh, another um, non-biological, non-human intelligence, and and uh, and it's up to us now to think about that intermediary role. Uh, and it would be possible that we let's say we were really successful we re we we do all the testing and even the testing is successful but maybe like four or five years in you think actually informing the ai systems these sentinels about other uh, biological life forms is actually not that helpful because <laughs> maybe may, maybe we're not strong enough to control the actions of uh, of emergent ai technology um but but right now it looks like we we, we have to take that risk uh, profoundly seriously does that does that answer the thank you if i may bring in another angle a human rights angle because i think there is a, a part of uh, your presentation especially in the beginning that sort of brought it as a goal by 2050 to um ensure by the, um, the biodiversity to be intact but even regeneration of species so i was thinking about this parallel project uh, of which maybe you're, you're aware of the right to healthy safe clean sustainable environment uh, which has brought forward several principles including the principle of intergenerational equity, uh, which first it means that every generation holds the earth with uh, past and future generations, and then it derives an obligation for our generation to not leave the, the, the earth worse than we found it. So my question is, do you see uh, that um, interspecies money could contribute to this debate, um, could help us uh, leave the better, you know, at least not worse um, than we found it. And I don't know, did you think about this? Thank you. Um, no, no, I think you're exactly right. I think I would actually be a wee bit more optimistic uh, and, and radical and suggest that, um, what, you know, in these communities that we're talking about primarily on, on, in the tropics, you're looking at 70% youth unemployment. And it's very unlikely, and here I fall back on my old training uh, working for The Economist, but it's really unlikely that most of these kids are going to see a proper job in the next 10 years. And as we can see from Sudan, um, on the contrary, Europe, 
and here I'm deeply critical of the European Union, um, has, has basically abdicated its responsibilities um, towards these countries. And, and you know, we just flew all of our diplomats out of Sudan. We flew them out and we left that country. It's on the verge of being a failed state. So in, the, in those contexts, unless we create the mechanism for uh, exchange, uh, you know, such so as a real value, real planetary value um, flowing in, in real time for re real micro observations and microservices, uh, I, I think it's going to be a really difficult, difficult future, you know. But on, on the positive side, um, when, when you have so much youth unemployment and underemployment, uh, the capacity to engage large numbers of people in regeneration of nature, of, of recovery of species, is really, really strong. And, and nature is very robust. And, and I, if I was betting now, and, and, and we come together in 2050, I would bet that actually we're going to be better than Victorian standards. I think we'll recover most of our ecosystems. And I think that communities will be rewarded for that. But, but you know, it's kind of high stakes poker now. Because um, that's actually something that I thought about while listening to your talk, um, which is whether the proposal that, that, that you have depends on these communities essentially being poor because if they have a better use of their time than taking pictures of the giraffe then they might engage in that right and if uh, we believe the projections that Africa will be the next continent that will make the big jump towards uh, yeah higher GDP and a better quality of life I, I recognize that my argument is more you know more long term of course like the one before but does this proposal essentially rely on there being vast numbers of people, of young people unemployed, and then you can give them this task to perform? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's necessary for the entire community to be involved in the, in the task making. But we are talking about a very distributed system, which have large blocks of money, and, and, it's, and it's divided up into literally millions of tasks. Um, and those tasks are then verified. And, and so if we were to look at a community, let's say like the communities we're looking at in Rwanda, you find that people are making one or two, three, four, five observations or simple services every day, and then they're receiving some credit for that. And over a month, um, if we think in economic terms, it might... Um, it might be half or more than half of their cash income. Because bear in mind, these communities are mostly subsistence farming communities. So do you want to buy uh, you know, soap or, or, or salt or sugar or flour? Um, they might be buying it with money that they've earned uh, in these. Um, I, I think it's unrealistic to expect that the community, you know, that people are going to be earning hundreds and thousands of dollars but i think it's entirely realistic to think that they might earn 50 or 100 dollars a month um based on the on the work that they do and in those communities at this point in time that's that's quite significant
Yeah, I think you're right that the question will remain outstanding for the next hundred years. Um, but on in computing, we do understand very well uh, that uh, diversity of, of intelligence within the com computing framework um, uh, creates the ability to um, combat, you know, um, bad coding errors. Um, so from a, from an artificial intelligence side, uh, the diversity of intelligence is really significant. And from a, from a, just a risk point of view, so we take a kind of actuarial point of view, uh, which again, is slightly unsatisfactory for a discussion like this, because it, uh, you might be right, Nicola, it might, might be that, that we don't need other ways of being in the world. Um, but we can't afford to take that risk. We simply cannot afford, um, as a as a very fragile biosphere floating, in, you know, spaceship Earth, um, and, and given that we've eradicated so much life. I mean, I don't know whether I made that very basic point that, you know, like ninety seven point two percent of biomass on on land now is humans and livestock animals uh, and and that, that's a complete turnaround from 1900 so we're, we're not talking about uh a process all of the natural processes that you know of natural selection and so on they're all out the window that's all gone that's we've, we've destroyed all of that it's far too fragile um what, what we presently have and and, and you know we we know this from uh, zoonotic diseases that, that uh, we are at great risk of uh, zoonotic transmission because you know it's kind of like the the, um, the brake pads on your car right <laughs> we've screwed over our brake pads like there's nothing between us and nature now you know we really I mean HIV AIDS was zoonotic COVID is obviously zoonotic um I say obviously maybe Here again, I'm, I'm quite optimistic because I, I think, in the end, even if we take the most radical success that I can possibly imagine, and then you're all saying, Oh, I remember when this crazy guy came to. <laughs> um, uh, and, and by the way, we're, we're open to offers if anyone's interested in contributing, but the um, I, I. I think we're talking about 0.3, of planetary GDP, uh, which is channeled through nature and comes out the other end, mostly, not entirely, but mostly to poorer communities. That, to me, in, in a world which is spending 3.7 to 4.2%, depending who you believe, on insurance products, it's, it's not, a, it's like a life on Earth, 0.4 percent it's not a major ask in that sense you know and if we go back to our ethiopian picture those people in nikolai they're not going away i mean um they're, they're, they're there you know that, that village down there it's it's 51 percent of that village is under the age of 17 years old they, they live entirely on what they can grow they're, they're not disappearing so, so we have to think more substantively about how we um, 
in cage. And, and and if we thought overseas development aid was going to be the heavy lifter, but look at Britain. I mean, we don't. No offense, Giovanni, but we don't even want to talk about Italy in this regard. But but Britain, you know, the foreign aid has collapsed from five billion to one billion without any public protest. No one's on the street except a few uh, Catholic and Anglican charities. That that's it. So 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 we we we, we and I, I emphasize again what Bloomberg was talking about: one trillion dollars going into nation. You know, so we we need those mechanisms, and they need to be entirely different and of entirely different ambition to what we previously had. And I think, um, you know, I've been in this really weird headspace of being on the one hand with AI scientists, the top AI scientists in the world, on the other hand, spending all my time in villages, like the uh, women's groups, um, you know, who are talking about not wanting so much, wanting to have a renewable cooking stove so they don't have to burn so much firewood or how far it is the water, you know. It, it, you've got to connect those two worlds in a substantive way, you know. Um, and, I, and I actually think it's possible. And there's a lot of evidence for why, you know, I would be optimistic. I mean, the, I, the only reason I got into this futuristic headspace was when I was the Africa um, correspondent for The Economist. Uh, I, was, I arrived in Africa when the mobile phone arrived. And I got into enormous arguments with, no offense, academics uh, and uh, and development actors, the worst predictably was GIZ, the German Development Agency. German Development Agency said as late as 2007, 2008, that Africans would never have a mobile phone. It's not going to happen to them. How can they possibly afford it? How would it work? Who's going to control the cell phone towers? And, and it was an endless discussion. And they just didn't believe that the price of mobile phones would collapse, you know. And the obvious fact is that Africans spend a lot more per capita relative to their income than Europeans do on, on mobile phones. But mobile phones are transformative. You get medical services, financial services, educational services. Um, and 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 so. Yeah, I think I think it's we already have a distributed system. We're just not utilizing it very well. I, Well, in your framework, uh, since uh, no, maybe except for the uh, for the ways uh, animals uh, uh, are not able to manage themselves to express um, um, intentions or make plans, so there would be somebody in charge for each species, each species with his tutor or his uh, manager, whoever. You, how do you uh, set up this team of managers uh, having to look uh, yeah, great, to endorse the the, the, yeah. need, the needs of the let me just uh, bring it. I'm sorry to inflict the doom bomb on you again, but sorry. Um, this is a good example, right? Um, we could also talk about orangutans, but the thing to do holds, um, there's only seven or eight scientists in the world who are expert on this, uh, this species. They're all in Australia and they're all involved with interspecies binding and they all, um, 
the dugong we picked, not just because it's a rare species, but from a game theory, game theoretic point of view, it's a very simple animal. So you have it's a herd animal, like, a, like uh, all grazing animals, it sits in a herd and it has uh, one bull and lo lots of cows and, and, and it's feeding on seagrass as a herd, maybe 80 animals, maybe 200, sometimes 300. And it, all the dugong wants is, please know that I'm there. Um, don't eat me, because the reason they're going extinct is that people eat them, you know, uh, and, uh, and allow me to eat seagrass. These are like pretty simple, simple needs, right? So you say to the fishermen's cooperative uh, in the community, you know, just always make room for the species. Don't use plastic fishing nets. Um, uh, exercise some security so to stop people uh, hunting uh, the animal. You know, um, in in that context, you have some sort of uh, the, the stewardship is provided uh, uh, by the scientists, who, by the way, want to get this higher level knowledge. Right, so that for them, there's they they are also in the win-win cycle, right? Because mm -hmm. suddenly, uh, they're getting this ability to observe uh, the, sp the, the communities are now observing their species uh, at, at higher resolution and higher frequency than than before, right? And they're knowing you know, how many animals are there in the herd and and how are they doing and whether they're stressed and and, and so on and so forth. Um, Obviously, some species will be harder to to set up a stewardship model, but but essentially that that countryside rule that I mentioned, you know, the, the three or four things that can be done for the species um, will be the kind of governance mechanism. Because it, you know, there there is another challenge, which is community has to feel. Uh, needs to feel, deserves to feel empowered, you know, They're, like they need to know, uh, well, okay, what are you asking me to do? Can I understand it? Can I actually do it? Um, and does it make a difference? Um, and, but but I think we, we will pick species that in the early stage that are, we feel are the most promising for that. Can I, can I ask a following question? So sure. um, I would like to understand, so it could, in this case of the dugong, so people are asked to do things uh, in order to enable the dugong to uh, no, survive and thrive. Um, uh, is money going into people for, so there are actions that are prohibited, the action that has to be incentivized. So what, so I, are the fishers going to be paid in order not to use certain kind of nets? Uh, are they, because uh, then I can imagine, I don't want to be too bad, but uh, you can also, there can also be a kind of blackmailing. So I want money because otherwise I'm going to uh, do this or do that. So isn't the bad kind of, this kind of negative uh, attitude yeah, that I, I may think, emerge? I just wonder. I mentioned we have a lot of game theory guys and, uh, I, I think that would be above any other question that has been asked today. Um, this is the, the most frightening question, which is un unintended uh, consequences. You know, can you, uh, you think you are creating a regenerative system, uh, actually you've just created another opportunity for human uh, uh, blackmail. But, but I think there are arguments against that. Uh, and the main argument is, this is an intelligent digital system, which is paying incremental amounts of money over long periods of time in a distributed way. Um, those increments dry up um, if if their you know the actions uh, are are damaging to 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 the species. So we think that there is a, a strong positive. Uh, incentive uh, but you know this is the whole nature of community conservation yeah. as a discipline this is what they have to deal with uh you know for a long time right um but yeah i think it's it, 
that's definitely the biggest challenge. Yeah. Thank you. Why you need digital money for that? Because it are transfers to you know, to people. Why 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 do you need to set up a digital currency for that? Um, yeah. um, sorry. Uh, when we're talking about these emerging economies, uh, they're very fractured. You know, uh, we're talking about seventy or eighty countries, uh, often with their own uh, often with their own currencies, their own central banks. Um, so you're talking about a very common problem, with, you know, very common economic basic problem. Uh, obviously, different communities, different cultures, different uh, species, but essentially it's the same problem. Right? Subsistence, subsistence um, uh, agricultural communities who not being rewarded, you know, but. If you want to distribute very large sums of money, billions of dollars a year, year on year, for several decades at least, it might be more you know, cost effective um, to have that uh, as um, its own currency, which these uh, governments then recognize as fiat within their, uh, within their, um, within their sovereign domain. Um, and like in the discussions we, we had in India, uh, you know, India is developing, the uh, Reserve Bank of India is developing its uh, uh, digital rupee. And, and the, the, what is important about that is you can actually build into those digital currencies some kind of governance mechanisms, you know, uh, and, and you can even sort of create temporal, spatial uh, qualities to that money. So you say, Okay, in Liberia, uh, in these districts of Liberia, the money is valid, but it's not valid in uh, Monrovia, the capital, right? You know, um, so I don't know for sure that, that that is the way it's going to go, but um, at this early speculative uh, stage, it seems like it might be a promising direction. Thank you very much. And sorry for keeping it in So I think uh, we would like to thank you very much for this uh, great presentation and for the very interesting and challenging discussion that we had. And um, <laughs> we are excited about this project and want to know more. And so we hope to continue interacting uh, with you and maybe to send us the material, some papers. That we, can, I will be, we will be very happy to share in the, in our cluster. So many uh, thanks. Thanks again. Uh, thanks, thanks again, Jonathan. I really appreciate uh, spending an afternoon with you. It's very, uh, yeah, I always appreciate the time. And I know it's a difficult concept right at the beginning to wrap your head around. Um, but we really are talking about fundamental equity, you know, the equity for extremely poor communities and equity across the species divide. So much appreciated. <laughs>